How's it going everyone? Taki here. Ever since news broke out that Samsung was having issues fabricating the Snapdragon 8 Gen 1 chips, I've been waiting to see how the revision of that processor would fare under the production of TSMC. In this video, we're going to check out what is arguably the most powerful Android device that you can buy today. This is the Red Magic 7S Pro with the Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1 SoC. Quick disclaimer, Newbie has sent over this Red Magic 7S Pro for this review. All of the opinions in this video are my own, and no one from the company saw this video before it was uploaded here for all of you. As is customary with this company, there are several options available to you if you want a Red Magic with this new chip. The model that I have here comes with the new Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1 SoC with the Adreno 730 GPU. We have a whopping 18 gigabytes of LPDDR5 RAM, 512 gigabytes of UFS 3.1 storage, a dual 5000 milliamp hour battery, and a 6.8 inch AMOLED display with 120 hertz refresh rate and a resolution of 1080 by 2400. For connectivity, we have Wi-Fi 6E, Bluetooth 5.2, and 4 or 5G depending on your market. All of this is running on Android 12. There are three styles available in this new product range, and the one that I have is called Supernova. It's a bit different than the older RM phones that I have because they're now using a large metal plate down the middle without any lights on the RM logo. Even though I think this one looks cool, if I was to buy one of these for myself, I would pick the white Mercury one without a doubt because it looks so good. It's a lot different than the other RM phones that I own in a good way, and I think it's a nice change of pace. Other things on this are pretty standard for this company. You have a dedicated gaming toggle switch on the left side with a set of speakers on either end of the device. One thing that is different this time around, however, is the fact that they have changed the location of the volume button. These have now been moved over to the right side of the phone, above the power button. I daily drive a phone from this company with this same layout, but it was a bit of a shock coming from the RM7. This new layout makes a lot more sense when you've got this thing in your hands playing some mobile games because you can quickly get to all of the controls in one spot. This time around, we only have one air intake vent with the other one on the side being completely removed. A big highlight for me with this new design is the fact that they've gone with an even frame around the device with rounded corners. These usually come with some indentations for some optional attachments, but that does not seem to be the case this time around. When it comes to the UI, there's not a whole lot to talk about here. We have a standard Red Magic skin on top of an Android 12 build. That's not to say that there are not any new changes here in the software because there are. The gaming UI went through a bit of an overhaul for the better. Now we have the games on the left side of the screen and a vertical list that you can easily change between with your left hand. You'll find details about the app stats like the time played under the title and you'll find the start button on the right side of the device. There is also an Android TV-ish UI, but I don't ever use that. One new addition to this UI is the ability to set per game GPU settings. In the past, we could only set settings for the entire SoC, but now we have some new profile options under the GPU settings menu. If you head over to custom, you'll be able to set some filtering options and you'll have access to auto VRS. As I already mentioned, this screen has a max refresh rate of 120 Hertz. This company has used screens with higher refresh rates than this in their older products, but 120 Hz is perfectly fine for the current games that are available on Android. It is still not that common to find games that support over 60 Hz, let alone 120. A key feature this time around is the fact that there is an under display camera on the 7S Pro. This is not something that I am personally all that concerned about, but I do like that it cleans up the top of the screen without having any cutaways or raised notches for a front facing camera. The camera is also well hidden and I am only able to see it at specific angles when I am trying to look for it. During gaming sessions, I never think about it at all, which is how things should be. Now let's start covering the things that I care about the most. What kind of performance can we get out of this new processor? Let's start off by taking a look at some synth benchmarks. In Geekbench 5 with the Rise CPU control, I got a single core score of 1332 and a multi-core score of 4198. When it comes to OpenCL, I got a score of 6493 and a Vulkan score of 7726. For reference, these are the scores that I got on the Red Magic 7 with the normal 8 Gen 1 chip. On the 3D Mark Wildlife Test, we maxed out the score, but we had a score of 2822 in the Wildlife Extreme Test. This is a slight boost over the score that I got in my Red Magic 7. 
Now, a lot of the advertised benefits of this new TSMC chip are supposed to be in power consumption and heat. And personally, I'm fine with that. The old RM7 did a decent job of handling the heat of the older processor, but we did have high power draw in edge cases. To better judge the improvements between these two nearly identical actively cooled devices, let's go to my Genshin Impact test. With our 30 minute no fan test, we got an average of 60 FPS with all the settings maxed out. Our CPU temp started at 39 Celsius and rose to 45 C by the end of the test where it was more or less normalized. I will just mention that this sensor is not the real sensor for the CPU itself. I've added the real sensor value near this so you can compare. When it comes to power consumption, we use an average of 5.7 watts for this test, which is a huge benefit over the RM7. In my old test from earlier this year, the RM7 ate a whopping 9.7 watts of power to get this same performance. Some of that difference is probably due to the screen in the RM7, but this is still a huge improvement. And to finish things off, let's enable the fan now to see how far our CPU temps can drop under load. Again, the listed sensor is wrong, so I have added the real values to this graph. When we go down to the battery life graphs, our power consumption is only 200 milliwatts higher than it was without using the fan at all. When it comes to native Android games with an SoC that is this powerful, you are going to be able to just about max out anything that is currently available. With 8 Plus Gen 1, you can be sure that you're going to be able to get a long life before something like this is actively targeted as a minimum spec for newer games. Let's take a look at a collection of games on the 7S Pro using the max settings available for each game. I've enabled the FPS reading on screen so you can see how the phone is performing. Now let's take a look at the emulation performance of this processor. Based on the synth benchmarks, I am not expecting to see any huge benefits in this processor compared to what the normal 8 Gen 1 chip can do, but I do think we might find some edge cases where this is the better of the two. There have also been some big emulator updates since the last time I looked at a powerful ARM processor. Now let's look at PS1 performance. For this, we're going to use the standalone duck station emulator and I paired it with the 5x resolution option, widescreen hacks, and PGXP. <laughs> For N64, we are using the Mupin 64 Plus GLES 3 core, and we are going to set our resolution at 1080p with the wide adjusted setting. We could go higher than 1080p if we wanted, but this will max out our vertical resolution. Depending on the game, this is also a great option for widescreen devices. We have a few good options for Dreamcast emulation on this device, but I'm going to stick with RA so we can use the Flycast Core. I have the rendering resolution set to 1440p, and we are using widescreen hacks. As you can probably imagine, PSP is no challenge for this processor. Now we're moving into the demanding systems, and our first one is 3DS with the Citra emulator. We have the rendering resolution set to 4x native for these games.
Now let's take a look at GameCube performance. For this, we are using the latest MMJR build. We could use the official emulator on a processor like this, but I find that this fork is much easier to use for testing, and I can get a bit of extra performance out. We have the games upscaled to 1080p, and we are using widescreen hacks. Sticking with the same emulator, here's Wii performance. Ether SX2 had some big updates and improvements since the last time I tested out a flagship Snapdragon chip, so I'm excited to see how games will perform. In this section, I am using the latest alpha build of Ether SX2. For these games, I tried to target 4x native resolution and only would drop from that point if the game could not maintain full speed. This is currently the best PS2 performance possible in a handheld device with good battery life.
Switch emulation on Android is still improving all the time, with Skyline able to boot a lot more games than it could the last time I reviewed a phone from this company. At least for the time being, the pay to win app still unfortunately has the best performance possible if you want to play demanding 3D games, but I hope that that will not be the case forever. Anyway, that's going to wrap up this coverage of the new RM7S Pro with the new Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1 processor. This processor is amazing, and I'm happy to see that we got some clear benefits with this change to TSMC. It's easy to get more power out of an overclock SKU if the power consumption also increases, so it was nice to see that we got a bit of a performance boost while keeping the power consumption down. If you want more information about this, you can take a look at the link down below. If you want to see more videos like this, consider taking a look at one of the other videos on screen now. Happy gaming everyone, Takiyao.